Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Every week we break down the, what's on the Cube's mind, what we're looking at, where we've been, and the top stories in tech, what's on the Wall Street Journal, what's in the New York Times. We're going to analyze the top news going on in mainstream media that relates to the enterprise and emerging tech, of course, AI. And we're going to go in and also talk about what we're looking at uh, down in the trenches, day-to-day -day operations of theCUBE. We're in all the, all the hot areas, AI, cloud, cloud native developers, cybersecurity. Dave, great to see you. Episode 12, we're getting our groove on. 12 Hello, episode, you know, we're getting the feel for the format. Um, you get the tie on, I got the hoodie. I think that speaks volumes. <laughs> How's that Wall Street Journal I saw you reading earlier? Got the paper. Yeah. Uh, Got them all. Hey, hey, but, hey, great, yeah. great. It's a lot of articles in the Wall Street Journal that actually we want to re reference as uh, context to some of the hot topics. I mean, just again, I think in the past four days, AI is just thundering this week. Is so much action. Uh, I had a great tweet I tweeted around the, um, from an AI guy who said, here's what's happened this week. And just like six major things happened this week. We'll go down there. Um, of course, the top story, in, at least in my mind, I'd love to get your thoughts is Sam Altman in Congress, in front of Congress doing his thing. And so that was huge because one, Sam Altman's a young guy. He's, he's not well known in the, in, in the mainstream. Uh, obviously ran Y Combinator, was the co-founder somewhat of OpenAI, but he did a good job. I thought it was great. It was also kind of political theater, which we'll get in on the rant section. The Supreme Court rules in favor of Google around the section 230. That's going to be a can of worms. AI everywhere, innovation impact, what is this an inflection point? Open versus closed, big guys extracting the rents, small guys, will they win? Is it a revolution or an evolution? And of course, enterprise section, open source is driving a lot of value, We're cloud native, we've got a lot of events coming up. And I know I want to talk about productivity because you have a great angle on why productivity is a benchmark. And of course, we've got our rant section, Dave. I got <laughs> Elon is in there, AI hype, so much. Let's start with AI. What's, what's, what's your take? You know, you know, what's interesting, John, is you remember, of course you do, when you first started using the internet and using email, you was like blown away. You know, you'd be in AOL and chat rooms, like this is, this is incredible. And you look back and it really sucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I find that, you know, I'm blown away by ChatGPT and Bard and all the AI momentum, but in many respects, it's, it's amazing, but it's just, it's, in many respects, not that good, right? So uh, since Google I/O and the new Bard, I've been I've been keeping browsers open, one for Bard, one for ChatGPT, and I've been doing kind of an A/B test, and they're they're really different. Um, sometimes Bard is better, sometimes ChatGPT is better, and then they also change. I found in some cases Bard was better, you know, a month ago than it is now. The other thing, I don't know if you've noticed this. Now, every time you go into ChatGPT, as of my last update in September 21, so they put in these, these I guess are guardrails, I guess. After my last update in September 2020, you might need to look at more recent details. So they're like putting in these caveats. Are, are those guardrails? Are that, is that meant to protect us? I mean, it's weird, you know, but I think my point being, 10 years from now, we're going to go, hey, John, remember when we first started using ChatGPT? Yeah. Wow, it was kind of a joke. <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're going to take it for granted. And I just think it's going to like explode. But right now, I think we're going to look back and say, wow, it really wasn't that good. Well, I, as, I, as a, it's it's interesting. I get asked all the time, which better, ChatGPT or, or BARD? I'm like, <laughs> you know, I got to say, I think ChatGPT is better than BARD. Again, it. It, Bart has good days and bad days. It's again, it's like it's like <laughs> any human. Like having a good day today or not on a good day, hungover, hallucinating, you know, implies all kinds of like off the rails. But I think definitely um, ChatGPT is better. Um, but still, the, the complaint I have with ChatGPT is I'm a subscriber and I don't get the plus, which is, gets me four. I'm not getting the updates. I'm not getting the plugin. I got to go in and sign up different things. They're moving so fast. I'm not getting the updates. So I have to kind of make a better choice there and they can make that easier in my opinion for users. Obviously we got our developers working on uh, some advanced stuff on cube data with our own LLC. Yeah, so that's going to be its own they're. foundational model, cube cube linguistics. You know, we talk a lot. Yeah, you you're definitely not paying for the, the service for GPT-4 cuz you're right. You got to go hunting and pecking for all the all the good stuff. Yeah, but yeah but, like, yeah, but your point though is really right on. Like I and we're going to get in this section that I'm going to we're going to get into after we get into some of the news is that when you talk about the web like that, that's a disruptive shift because the early 
days were crude and the elementary, very embryonic, as they say, in business school. And what that means is, is that it doesn't look good enough for the mainstream and the existing mainstream players that service that market look at it as a toy, incomplete, inadequate. Um, oh, it's on the cutting, bleeding edge. You know, dial up was slow, AOL chat rooms were lame, the graphics sucked, but people who saw that through that were like, this is totally game changing because the alternative, if this goes successful, which you can see clearly, is that it would replace direct response. I don't have to do mail. I can get um, self-service on finding information. And of course, finding what you're looking for became a Google search thing. And so you had a lot of people coming in. That completely changed wor the world, okay? That was a oh. world changing moment. The PC before that, Ken Olson said, that's a toy. No, a PC will never be on anyone's home in anyone's home. Of course, that's the famous founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, Ken Olson, who said, who said that. There was public comments. A PC at home, why would anyone want a PC at home? Says the king of the mini computer. Hence, they're so, out of business. <laughs> they're, I, not uh, around, they're, they're not around business. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I remember well PC adoption. I used the PC when I was in college when I was you know, programming. And but but when you went to work in the in the early '80s, there were no really there weren't really many PCs on on the desks. We at IDC we had these Wang terminals. It was a mini computer, right? And we would do all the reports on Wang terminals, and we would do all the spreadsheet work. There were no spreadsheets. You'd do it on log graph paper. And then I remember we all got Lotus training. And it was game changing. We got a PC and we had to sign up and share. Like, use, first of all, nobody used the PC at the beginning, and then people started to use it. And then all of a sudden, PCs started to pop up. We, I shared an office with somebody, we shared a PC, and then we got our own PCs, and then everybody had a PC, and then we networked the PC in a lens. You could just see the whole thing exploding. Yeah. And the people who didn't poo poo it, like the Michael Dells of the world, became billionaires. And, the, and of course, Ken Olson was extremely successful, but you know, there's, there's, as John yeah. Chambers says, there's no entitlement and they're, yeah. they were all out of business. Yeah, and I, and I think we're going to get into this in the third section of this initial uh, block of commentary around the innovation impact. And the question will be, are we on this third major revolution, major revolution inflection point? And if that's the case, there will be more billion, new billionaires. There will be people going out of business or will they? And is it different? And we're going to compare it. We're going to go into that, but let's get into the top news. OpenAI, uh, Sam Altman was in front of Congress. All the people saying, hey, we need to be regulated. That is such BS in my opinion. That's gonna, that's gonna be one of my rant sections, but I wanna just say that, that that was very compelling that he was like admitting that he's got a fear of AI when asked. And it wasn't about fear of job loss, which I think is a BS argument. It was fear that the world, something would, bad would happen in the world, which we talked about on two pods ago around a you know, playing in the Hudson moment, referencing the Twitter moment where everyone saw Twitter value. Like, okay, I get it, Twitter works that way. So he's kind of agreeing with us, Dave, that he's fearful of a moment where it, something bad could happen with AI. Um, and that's where it kicks in the old Terminator, old guys like us, like, oh yeah, the Terminator, Skynet. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that fully, but I do think he's onto something there. And also I thought his, his presentation was strong. He came across great uh, for the industry. Um, I thought it was a little bit staged. IBM was there, I thought IBM did awesome. They were kind of the, the firm corporate company, although they got work to do on A, which we can, we can riff on the enterprise section. Sam was great. I didn't know that he's not has no equity in OpenAI, which he disclosed when asked, are you rich? And he's like, didn't he say? By the way, he is rich, by the way, but he's not making yeah. any equity on OpenAI. Didn't he say something like, you know, he can, didn't his salary didn't include healthcare or some something like that? It's like, what was that? He's a wealthy individual. He's, he's rich. Right? So that he's was, not poor. Right. Let's put it this way: he's not poor. Okay, but but you know, to your to your point about like the dangers, I, like you know, Trump the other day was saying we should arm teachers. Like, there's a lot of teachers who used to be in the military, so. We should give them firearms to protect for these, you know, these crazy people going into schools. Whether you agree with that or not, you could envision a day where somebody says, "Okay, let's give some robot, you know, because you don't, you can't afford to necessarily, you know, arm every school or put security in every school. You probably should do it anyway, but let's put a robot there with firearms to protect people." Well, 
what happens if that robot gets hacked and all of a sudden starts shooting people? And then the, the if you if you fast forward, I don't know how many years, 50, 100 years, if there are machines that are autodidactic that can you know learn on their own that are more intelligent than humans, you know, they become our overlords. And that's the sort of scenario. I don't know what the probability of that is, but it's it, it's it's probably not impossible that that happens. And so people I think are rightfully concerned about that. Like you always say, everything in the movies becomes true except teleporting. And <laughs> no, that's no, a scary everything scenario. Everything in Star Trek and Star Wars will be real. I think that's <laughs> going to be, most of those developers will watch those movies. I think sci it's very sci-fi moment, but to your point, AI is early, right? We're going to get to that section. We're going to talk about the innovation piece. Remember Lost in Space? <laughs> hey, Will Robinson, remember Danger. when the robot went Danger. crazy? He like <laughs> he like lost his mind and they, he turned into like a, the evil robot and they had to reprogram him, um, right? Well, I mean, there is a little little bit of that going on in, in the robotics and Elon Musk thinks he's got the best uh, best, best AI. We'll get to that. Again, we'll get to this. Let's get, let's stay with well, all of them. So on the, yeah, I know you like to rant about the government, which we'll, we'll get into in the policy side of things. But a couple things, I thought Congress was just absolutely trying to get votes. They were trying to look hip, like they are into the AI thing, but yet also cautiously optimistic and asking the most dumbest questions again as highlights why people like Sam Altman, Mark Zuckerberg, and all these other tech legends who have monopolies and, and the machines that screw things up. I mean, like people at Facebook right now, people might not know this, but a lot of people who work and made a lot of money at Facebook are, are who have left are ashamed publicly for what they've done. They they don't like the machine that they helped build and they're embarrassed. And they're in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of like anti-Facebook going around for people who were recruited in, who, by the way, made tons of money, millionaires. They don't like what they did. And when they go out in the real world and go, oh my God, you worked at Facebook, they're they get changed by the by the crowd. So so there's a lot of that going on. So Zuckerberg did it. Uh, Google did it, Facebook did it. They say, we should be regulated. By who, the Congress? These people asking these questions, they couldn't regulate their way out of a wet paper bag. Right? This these is are, a problem. This these problem. are people who asked um, Zuckerberg how he makes money if he gives it away for free. Remember? Exactly. I mean, I, I mean, come on. So, the tech, you know, I, the I wonder, people, John, it's, all, it's all optics, Dave. It's Silicon the, Valley, it's all optics so they can say, look, we, we offered it up. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court rules in favor yeah, of Google sure. on Section 230, which is from the 90s. So you got lawmakers it, approving and, and the Supreme Court validating 90s law on tech. And you talk about dial up and browsers. They weren't even out, they weren't even built yet. So that's like regulating AI now. Imagine regulating the internet, the web, in 1996, okay? Possible. Microsoft didn't even have a browser built yet. They did that in 97, okay? Netscape was the number one browser. Imagine if the government said, whoa, this internet thing, it's gonna kill direct mail and, <laughs> and people's ability to go to events. I don't know. And then that would be brutal. Imagine that did they you did see, that. Did you see uh, Home Depot had soft earnings uh, this week, and they blame part of it on you know shrinkage, where people you know organized crime is like stealing and shoplifting, and they're losing a lot of money, like a half a billion dollars a year, or some a huge number, it might even be a quarter. And the, and then what they're doing is they'll like steal a bunch of stuff, and then they'll put it online to an online retailer reseller like Amazon. So the question is a good one: is should an Amazon or other online retailers be responsible? For sellers that are selling hot goods no, on their platform. No, not at all, not at all. They should, okay. Home Depot okay. should have better self-service checkout. You know how easy it is to steal from Home Depot? Yeah, but this, yeah, but there's new laws that say, okay, we're not going to prosecute people unless it was, you know, more than $10,000. So people are going in and they're, they're doing petty theft and people are, you know, getting shot trying to stop people, you know, and then people are, organized crime is breaking in at night to these jewelry stores and these other high-end retailers and, you know, it's a serious problem, but, and then they, I don't they think go Amazon, on to. I don't think Amazon should be punished for, if you, if I go in and steal stuff from Home Depot or a jewelry store and they can prove that it, I, that's their goods and I'm pushing it on Amazon, I should be the one that's arrested. Yeah, but 
but but should Amazon have no responsibility for reselling those products, those those stolen products? I don't think they should. should. Should should they not have some kind of value? They should have. I mean, they're they smart enough. Have, they should have first principles, obviously. I mean, look, Andy. Well, what if, Andy Jassy wait, 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 wait. What if they? What if they? Was well, he? I didn't hear it. But what if they're selling like way under? They're consistently undercutting the average price on Amazon when there's these some some small little little seller who doesn't have the volume of like a CVS or a Walmart and they're undercutting them. I mean, that's good competition away, but isn't that like a signal that there may be hot goods and they maybe should be investigated? You're saying Amazon should have no responsibility for that? Oh, you're making a lot of assumptions there, but I mean, I don't know what to say for those assumptions that have no, that don't hold any water. So, okay, I'll give you an example. So I, okay. I buy toothpaste. I use like Arm & Hammer toothpaste and it's way overpriced. And, and, and I go into CVS and I buy it. It's like 10 bucks a tube or something stupid. Well, I, I, one day I'm teeth. searching. Oh, yeah, that's why teeth. What do you thanks, thanks, John. One day I'm, 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 sponsor? I'm, I'm searching. Uh, no, it should be, though. Uh, one day I'm searching on Amazon. And I see the toothpaste is like half the price. I'm like, wow, CVS is ripping me off. So I order a bunch of toothpaste. It comes in these like it was clearly stolen. I mean, the, the boxes are all ripped up and, you know, they're all bent to cup. Half of them are ripped open. It was like, well, if you don't it like, was it, like you won't use like Amazon. The, it was, it was like the story. Sopranos yeah. sold it, you know, stole it and put it out there. But so, I mean, I bet you, but but shouldn't the retailer be, these big retailers, shouldn't they have some responsibility for that? No, you're saying, Jassy was asked about this. I didn't know that. No, no, no. He asked about when it came to books and, and certain kind of like books and people, like offensive books, because, you know, it was the thing about the Jewish um, books that were on, anti-Semitic books that were on Amazon. But he, but he it was a similar issue. Once you start banning things for this kind of issue, then you- That's different. Oh, oh, that's that's free oh, speech. No. Well, I know, but people want it gone. Well, that's different. That's some different people, than, some than stolen view, goods. Some people view, hey, fucking stolen goods coming to me, I don't care. Like, but look, if you have toothpastes come in and you don't like the packaging, or you think it's not legit, you're pissed at Amazon for that. That's Amazon's issue. They should manage that on their end as customer satisfaction. And if they let stuff on their network go through this, then their people are sliding in. I'm sure Amazon has a policy. If I was running Amazon, I'm sure Jassy would be the same way. They want the best consumer experience, faster, lower cost. If it's not legit product, you complain. And then, or, or they figure out a way to stop counterfeiting or stolen goods. But I don't think they should be held legally liable for that. I don't think it's their their obligation to spot check every transaction. Well, but should they do anything opinion. about it? Should they use their should they use their I'm, I'm sure Andy Jassy and Amazon doesn't want stolen goods to be sold on their network. They're honest people, but should they should they do more to try to police that? First of all, I don't know what they're doing. They have to because to otherwise they'll it. lose customers. That's 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 what the way I would look at. It. I mean, look at if 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 the, if there is illegal or stolen goods on trafficking through the system, that's not good for business. Okay, because there's a lot of potential issues there. Tampering. Why? It's like tampering. a black market. If you got it's toothpaste, like a black market. Well, if you got toothpaste like, coming. How do you know there's no fentanyl in there? It's like it's been poisoned. Yeah, no, it's a good point. So, but I mean, it's like a black market on Amazon. Yeah. I, def, I are absolutely. You buying, are you buying toothpaste from Amazon after that experience? No, I stopped. I'm paying, I'm paying up. Yeah. I'm paying up. I'm going to CVS. You're right. I mean, you're yeah. making a good point there. But I bet you other people keep buying, you know, TVs, watches, counterfeit watches. I mean, I'm sure all that well, stuff I mean, going on. I think, I think this is where back to the AI, circling back to AI, where we got tangent here. I think technology will help solve these problems. Again, this comes up all the time when we go in the weeds on the enterprise section alone, how data and more data comes in. AI helps manage where humans can't do everything. And so I think you'll see areas. So just, just for the folks out there, there's a, a Twitter person, Akash Gupta, A-A-K-A-S-H-G-0 is his Twitter handle. Two A's, Kosh G-0. He wrote a post I retweeted. In the last four days, here's what's happened. GS Robots, MedPalm 2, which is Google's medical thing, Google X, Adobe, Tesla Optimus AI, new ChatGPT UI, Unreal Engine 5.2.0. Amazon Burnham, Amazon AI search, Sam Altman in DC, Apple voice cloning, Alzheimer's detection, open AI, open sourced their LLM, okay? This is like just in the past four days. The robots, the cyber arms, like you mentioned uh, lost in space, uh, similar, um, that, that's like robotic extensions. The, the MedPalm 2 is, is basically Google's thing that's outperforming doctors. 
Okay, this is a medical thing, right? So it's a version of, uh, of their palm model tuned for medical use cases, like reading x-rays and all that stuff. Yeah, making better diagnoses and, and more great, accurate And he links to a paper. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just off the charts and just how it's building on top of GPT-3.0, I mean, 3.5, and just incredible. Google X Adobe announced a geospatial creator in Aero. Um, Google I.O. Um, had the, the spatial, geospatial creator Unity. Just more content, Tesla, uh, robotics. Um, you mentioned that later. They're in a position to do well there in the new UI. Just, Dave, that's four days. Okay, so this is what I'm getting into, this, this, this section that I want to bring up, our, our historical perspectives. There's a couple conversations going on around open versus proprietary, okay? Big player, small player. So we'll start with the, the big player, small player. And so the debate is, are we in a revolution with AI or an evolution? So, you know, you and I both agree the PC was a revolutionary moment. Yeah. You mentioned yeah, the I, web. Yeah, well, let's, well, what was the web? It was revolutionary, but, but a lot of the incumbents took advantage of the web. Like take, take, take Dell computers back then. So they were doing like mail order and stuff. And then the web came, they weren't an internet player, but they took amazing advantage of the internet. I mean, their stock boomed in the nineties when, you know, the internet was just getting started and they were doing direct, yeah. you know, direct sales over the internet. So that was an example of an incumbent. And I think the answer to your question is yes and yes. I definitely think there's going to be disruption. I think there's no question. This is going to be a huge new wave, you mean, bigger than anything you mean we've AI, ever seen you mean before. AI, you mean AI. AI, yes, yes, absolutely. All right, so we're talking, about, we're talking about three things, PC, Internet web and, and AI. Then a, and then AI. And I think AI is going to be bigger than all of them. I agree with that. Whoever made, who's making that assertion, I think you are too. I yeah. think that was the first thing you said. Um, but as well, I think the incumbents can really take advantage of this. Uh, in other words, any industry. And so I think the ones that are going to be left behind are the ones that don't lean into it and try to figure out how they can get yeah. unique competitive advantage. But I do, I also think, like Sam Altman was asked, like, well, how are you going to make money? He says, ah, I kind of like the subscription. They're going to, they asked him, are you going to do ads? He goes, I kind of like the subscription model. I think they're, they haven't figured it out yet, but somebody's going to come up with a brand new model. You remember you were there in the early days of keyword search, yeah. right? And advertising. And people thought that was a really dumb idea at the time. Well, I'm sure there's ideas that are going to occur that people really have business models that people haven't thought of you know, like to think iTunes and how that changed things and changed the whole music industry. <laughs> and I think something else is going to emerge here to your point that's going to be disruptive. So I think it's going to be both. I, I think this is a great discussion because the big players, I mean, Dell was not a big player in 1996. Okay, so so they were still an, a PC revolutionary, right? So that was good, right? So they, they leaned into it. They were small, still disruptive. But I think the key point here is, is that- you Say Intel? 96? No, Intel was, they were, they were forming their no, monopoly. Dell, Dell, I'm talking about Michael oh, Dell, Dell, sorry. Michael Dell. Sorry. They sorry. just were launching direct sales and they were mail order. Yeah, they were mail order. They were, exactly. So they were mail order, PC magazine ads. I mean, you know, we, we riff with Michael all the time about this. He's, he's my age. So, you know, he actually tried to hire me once. I said no to him. I was like, why do I want to work for a, a piece of crap mail order company? Of course, I was working at HP at the time. Um, at that, and then he pivoted. He just reinvested and went from mail order with the internet, which allowed him and Web to do self-service ordering, then he hit, then he did great manufacturing where you had you know, everything close to each other, you know, in, in how they manufactured and they had build to order. Build to, to order, order was order. Was, yeah. was absolutely the most innovative thing that Michael Dell's team did, besides realizing they can reduce the channel with direct mail. Direct response with the web absolutely put them in orbit and that's the history behind Dell. And I didn't see that, that's why I didn't go to join them and been like the 18th employee uh, for Dell. Bad uh, call, John. <laughs> I made a lot of bad calls, Dave. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I went so good in the keyboard. So much car tissue we learned, that's, don't do that. I could have gone to work for Microsoft, I guess, I could have gone to work for Microsoft in Seattle in, in 1988. That was and, a bad call. Intel tried, to hire, no, my, Intel tried to hire me in 87, but I went to HP, and not Hewlett Packard, IBM, and then Hewlett Packard in 1988. And that was a great run. 1988, Hewlett Packard was 8 billion in sales, and that went to 36 billion when I left in 97 to do the search startup. And I just literally quit the big corporate job at HP to do something that no one thought was like, what the hell, why would anyone buy a keyword for search engines? Paid, paid keywords, ridiculous idea. The the which ended up being the billions of dollars that 
as it is now. That a time of HP was really strong, um, but HP and the, these guys survived. Now the question here is, who captures the value on these inflection points? And my thesis is always been when you have disruption like this, revolutionary disruption, you have big winners that have never been seen before. New players emerge and the, the point you made about the web earlier, the market looks nascent and incomplete to everyone else. And if the startups and the entrepreneurs who have opportunity recognition see it, can connect the dots, move fast, capture a position, innovate and make it better. And I think, and that's when they, when it goes mainstream, they capture the value, wealth capture, and they capture the, the market value. The question is, in this wave, is Google, Amazon, Meta, are they going to capture the value? Or is it going to be split between startups and the big guys? Because remember, the big incumbents, some of them have to die. Otherwise, it's not a revolution. That's an evolution. So the, this is an interesting conversation. And there's a lot of new things in play. Open source software is booming. You have open software that's free. You have high accelerated cycle times for product development. I just interviewed a company today called Virtual Layer. That's just Visual Layer. That's got $7 million in funding. I interviewed Danny Bixson, who I met in 2014. He got funded by Madrona and Insight. Uh, these smart Israelis, they're killing it right now. They just, this, they nailed the data problem. They got their project started in open source, Dave. Now they got seven million in seed funding. So, so John. So like, so like, he's like, this is a revolution. Of course, you know, I love the attitude of the startup there and the startup side. What do you think? Because this is, and I, I think it's it's going to be both, for the first time, like in a major way. I mean, I wouldn't call Dell in the web days like the big player, but they rode that wave. So, to your point, it's a. Is so, there a Ken Olson Digital Equipment Corporation out there that's going to top? So, so to, to come back to the internet. So, in when in the '90s, when for between let's call it '96 and 2000, when the stock market was going crazy, it was CMGI who they didn't make anything; they just invested in companies. You know, Internet Capital Group, uh, uh, AOL was the hot stock. Remember AOL, how hot it was. Remember they ended up, you know, by acquiring Time Warner. Um, or, uh, uh, and then uh, other way around actually. And then Cisco, right? The, who made money during the gold rush? They would say the people who sold picks and axes, uh, Yahoo, EMC, these companies were on fire during the, the late nineties. And who ended up winning in the internet? Now Amazon was there as well. But, uh, so who ended up you know, make, making it? So who made it really made it through? Amazon for sure, yeah, eBay, did okay, obviously, but Google was the big winner, right? Um, and so, to your point, well, well on, on what? Well, I'm not saying where Amazon uh, didn't win, the web. No, Amazon, Amazon did win yeah. with the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 AOL didn't. You know, you could argue Cisco, EMC, or certainly Yahoo didn't. You could argue Cisco and EMC were sort of overhyped in the. You know, how they say things are overhyped at the beginning yeah. and underhyped. You know, to, when it really takes off. I would say Cisco, EMC, Yahoo, AOL, they were overhyped. Now Cisco and EMC, now Dell, did pretty well, but they weren't the dominant players. You know, the market got what that the, wrong. What did the internet kill? Question to you, what did the internet kill? If PC killed the mini computer and mainframe, what did, from a computing standpoint, productivity, we'll get into that later, what did the internet kill? Telecommunications? E media. John Chambers was on the Cube, it, episode it, it six. Killed, it, it killed media. Right, it killed print media. Yeah, a lot of people right? that were old school, phone calls. Killed this, killed this, right? <laughs> Changed that. Yeah, Wall Street Journal was one of the first websites. They had one of the best apps, one of the best websites. Yeah, I remember that. So the, so, so the incumbents who lasted, they were able to take advantage of it. Um, like we were using the Dell example, Google came out, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, Microsoft kind of missed it. Remember, Microsoft was all about tr trying to compete in the web browser, and they went sideways until Satya came in. So, it was, you know, it really killed into. To my point, it killed industries, right? And I think the same could potentially happen with AI. So I, you'll, I, you'll I got, I got a call, I got a call uh, called out on this, my my rant on this from some younger generations, people in their thirties, late thirties. Uh, we were chatting. Um, 
at, a, at an event. They said, hey, but, but what about the iPhone though? That's a weird inflection point. Like, well, I go, I won't, I didn't consider that revolutionary in the sense of it was already part of web, web two apps and Apple, right? So the iPhone, I would say was a physical, I mean, it's close. I mean, I'm not going to poo poo that. Like the, the recognition of the iPhone in 2007 was a moment that was interesting. But I still think AI will be bigger than that. I think you look at cloud, Amazon Web Services, is that an inflection point? I don't think as big as AI. I think even, even the, the monster shift that Apple, iPhone, which killed Nokia and killed a lot of things, all the Blackberries, well documented, changed the app game, created SaaS. Apple, iPhone, and cloud, in my opinion, close, but still an extension of the web and web 2.0, that moment in time was, I think that's where the internet killed existing people. And then John Chambers then came on theCUBE, which by the way, he, he was an extension of the PC industry, as you said, connecting PCs that connected companies like Cisco was created from that generation. Then in, they, they powered the internet, obviously. He said on theCUBE, he predicted voice would be dead and his customers were all telecom companies. And what do we do today? No one thinks about their phone bill. WhatsApp's free. So I think you know, things get killed, but you got to put them in the right bucket. And that's why I'm not saying iPhone and cloud of AWS was not a revolution. I mean, that was an evolution, but a good one, big one. Well, what I would say is that as the, as the internet matured and become more reliable, remember Bob Metcalf used to say it's going to crash and he had some insight to that, but companies like Amazon, Google, Apple, they were able to leverage that more reliable infrastructure to, to basically disrupt print media, advertising, retail, music, telecoms. I mean, virtually every industry, you remember the old N Nicholas Negroponte brick, uh, you know, uh, Adams versus, you know, physical brick and mortar, right? Um, yeah. That that was in the, in, the, in the thinking was, okay, the businesses around, you know, Adams are going to be, you know, really disrupted, but they were all disrupted. I mean, you know, everybody was impacted. I think the same thing's going to happen here at times maybe 10 or a hundred. Yeah. And, and, and I think your point about who wins and who leans into the Michael Delcom was great. I, I was a colleague with the CTO of Next Computer, which was bought by Apple. And this person was Steve Jobs' right-hand man on all things software, um, not hardware, soft, on the software side. And uh, he and I would travel together when we worked together. And um, he would tell me, I would ask him questions about Steve Jobs and, and the iPod, which then became the iPhone came out of that. All that ob obsession with Apple was about Steve Jobs had Sony envy. He hated Sony because they had great products. Their, their PCs at that time were great. They had the Walkman and even in the movies, he, they show him with the Walkman on. He hated the Walkman. He hated the fact that Sony was better than him. And he really wanted to make a better product than Sony. So his obsession with killing the Walkman created the iPod. That comes out of the PC. Now you mentioned Michael Dell. He saw the web as the new direct mail and said, hey, which got killed, direct mail. You don't have, you don't, see, you don't get, you get direct mail now, but back then that's all you could do. You had to send invites to a seminar. You'd send out a mailer and you go to a hotel and you have a presentation. There was no webinars, there was no chat rooms. So Michael Dell leaned into that. So you have jobs leads in, leans from the PC all the way through to the iPod. So he got the web, created the Apple store. And it's just, again, the, the entrepreneurs will ultimately capture the value. That's my thesis. And I think AI is going to create more entrepreneurial energy and wealth creation than anything prior to the internet and PC. I think PC, internet, internet web, and AI will be the three most compelling society changing inflection points, wealth creation, productivity, I mean, overall impact easily. And again, and that even comparing to the iPhone, which is we all know was was huge, was just an extension of Jobs to the iPod to the iPhone. Now I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but now AI is completely brand new. Some kid can come out of college. That's why I want to be 25 again, because I would be totally doing an AI startup right now if I was in my 20s. I mean, absolutely, computer science degree, knowledge of the industry, problems to solve everywhere, making things better. It's, this is going to be right. Now the question is going to be, 
do people leave Amazon Web Services to go do a startup? Do they leave Apple to do a startup? Do they leave IBM to do a startup? It's going to be very interesting, Dave. And it's, I, I tell you right now, well, they're getting I'm, fired. I'm, on, I'm on the disruption revolution side. So with wealth creation comes wealth destruction. Right, That's, they, often, they often go hand in hand. It's not necessarily a zero sum game, but we're at the point now where you pointed out earlier, where, do, where machines in many cases are making better diagnoses than doctors. So healthcare is going to get disrupted. Um, what about driving? What about fully autonomous? I mean, I've kind of been a skeptic, but, but how is that going to affect logistics, uh, ride sharing, taxis, you know, everything, trucking. How about retail stores? Can AI, why do you go to retail stores? That's fun to shop, but you know, hey, sometimes you don't want to have to find a parking space at the mall. What if I can actually try on clothes with AI and VR headsets and actually see how it looks and order it and have it perfectly tailored for me? I mean, that's a highly disruptive, you know, potential. I think, I think, the, I think these use cases are going to be really interesting. And, you know, we talk about on the cube all the time, you know, what are the use cases that are going to be changed and what are the bets that are being made by the investors? And I'll see who are the horses on the track, AKA the startups and companies. And if you look at, I saw Walt Mossberg, a famous columnist for the Wall Street Journal did, did uh, started All Things D and then Rico with Kara Swisher. He was, had a little rant. He's like, you know, I used to, he, Apple stores, Apple stores are sucks now. It's, it's so much, I had to wait 45 minutes. I couldn't get a genius bar appointment. He was kind of ranting on the, yeah. he's ranting on the Apple store saying they were once the gold standard. Now it's a pain in the ass. And, and so, okay, how does AI change that? Well, maybe prepare knowing what my machine's doing, having some IOT devices in there or doing something. Home Depot, your example of theft, hey, put cameras everywhere, you know, track who's stealing it. Um, I mean, so there's all kinds of ways. And again, I think there's going to be a lot of positive change, but again, we, we, will, we will see a plane on the Hudson moment, AK to the Twitter example, something with AI, it's going to be all great until something happens. Well, and, and, you know, we've talked about this before, but I think Amazon could really get disrupted if AI can allow you to directly order from a manufacturer, cut out the middleman and direct, you know, drop ship right from the factory. You know, that's, you know, really interesting. Now, now maybe Amazon does, Amazon does some of that, but they have the huge, you know, warehouse infrastructure. And then you talk about the AI moment, you know, Musk said, we're going to have our chat GPT moment when all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of thousands of cars have fully autonomous driving with a software download. Now, been kind of promising that for a while, but think about that. If in fact, he can succeed at that, and if it's true that he's got the best AI. I know you want to talk about this. Wow, that's going to totally disrupt the automobile industry. Yeah, I mean, I think he has to have good AI, and he, he can't, I mean, his operations require <laughs> non-disruptive, they can't hallucinate. I mean, you can't, you're seeing Tesla cases where cars have crashed. I mean, I have, I have, a, I don't have a Tesla, but I got a car that has those lane things. And sometimes yeah. when they do construction, they kind of paint over the marks. It gets yep. confused. It doesn't, and I can, the car's heavy, so it pulls. I can see someone maybe holding the wheel and maybe get jacked in the next lane. Yeah, totally. I, you know, l l let me, um, I've kind of been a skeptic on fully autonomous driving. And because I, 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 I asked this question, why is it that we don't let people drive until they're 16 years old? Is it, I mean, why not, why not? 12 or 13 or 14. And I think it's because there's an organic learning that takes place. And these these are not learning systems. I mean, even, I don't know who said it, it was, might've been Sam Altman or somebody said, you know, they're not autodidact, they're not self-teaching at this point in time. They get better, they improve with training, but they're not learning systems. And the human brain is a learning system. And it takes 16 years for us to get mature enough to actually you know, be trusted to drive. You know, why is that now? Will machines be able to compress that time and actually replicate that? Maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's very hard to predict. The, the things that machines could do, that that uh, that people could do rather, that machines couldn't do, they're changed. They're they're, they're 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 changing so rapidly. You know, robots you couldn't climb stairs five seven years ago. <laughs> I mean, that's well, a simple now, well, example. Well, well, now there's going to be a lot of use cases where the robots will help us. I mean, and it, it all oh, yeah. it all comes down to two like, two questions. One is, do you regulate it, or and how what does that look like? And two, you know, what's going to be the impact, productivity and or to society? 
regulation I'm against, the Google announcement winning the, the course case with Section 230, your question about does Amazon and Home Depot, the liability. Uh, note here, there's a, there's a Tech Dirt article where details, I've pulled this up since you brought it up. Um, Thomas, um, Supreme Court Justice, um, said he laid out the reasons why he thinks 230 is a good thing, why we should still keep it. I'll read it to you, I'll get your reaction. Yeah, he please. says, two, Section 230, which is the 1998 Telecommunication Act for platforms, exists to avoid applying secondary liability to third parties who aren't actively engaged in knowingly trying to help someone else violate the law. So interesting little tidbit there. So now it, we always kind of put the blanket thing there, like platforms are abusing two, section 230, true. But that's a pretty cogent point, what he's saying. Your point is, well, if Amazon's putting... actively knowingly helping someone push stolen goods, Okay. Then, but so now, but so, so the difference is you've got, it's putting the onus on somebody to prove that Amazon is doing that versus putting the onus on Amazon to actually police it. Yeah. Different things, right? So you got, if you got to prove that Amazon, they're going to have to find emails that said, hey, we know people are, you know, it's like the Binance thing. We know people are breaking the rules, but let's look the other way. And, I, I mean, I could go either way on that, honestly, John. I mean, I can see Thomas's point, and I'm well. He goes. I'm, he goes. He goes further. Well, and then this adds to your point. Thomas also recognizes that if you make the secondary liability too broad, it sweeps in all sorts of innocent bystanders, which is your point. Which is like, okay, it's kind of broad. <laughs> it's yeah. like, and we can say we're a platform, right, and not get sued, right? Or you know, you know, we we're not a platform, and we're a publisher. So. I think this is an interesting topic. We're going to keep following it. So one is no regulation with AI. I think regulating AI right now would be the equivalent. Again, I'll say it again. Regulating AI right now would be the equivalent of regulating the web in 1997, 98. Okay, imagine the handcuffs and the drag, the anchor drag on that growth. That would just be like, you know, okay, but, horrible but AI innovation. AI is going to be regulated. I'll, I'll tell you where. It's going to be regulated in the EU. Guarantee the EU is going to come up like they did with, with GDPR. They're going to come up with some, except it's going to be harder even. Um, they're going to come up with some framework and some guardrails that you know probably won't get tested in court um, for a long, long time, but they're going to do it. And then you know who else is going to regulate AI is China. And because China doesn't debate in Congress, they don't have these public debates. And well, should we? Or shouldn't kind of, we? They are kind of regulating AI for yes. And and, and so China will for just, their advantage and also to suppress yes, freedom. Yeah, exactly. They will make a decision, and then those two um, regulating authorities are going to be petri dishes for how these regulations work. And I think I, my prediction is the U.S. is going to. Well, what do we do? We're going to stare at our navel for a long time because they don't have any idea how to approach this. And it's going to be Wild West. Yeah. There are going to be unintended consequences. And then either what's going to happen, like it's happening with TikTok, states are going to take it into their own hands, which would really suck because then you've got to do, you know, yeah. 50 different you know rules. Um, or the, the federal government is going to actually step up and help figure this out. But I think the best bet is that the industry steps up and provides its own guardrails. That the industry has to lead. Guardrails. That's the code word for the dog whistle for don't regulate us. We'll we'll, we'll call it guardrails. But but what the hell does that mean? I think. I mean, th th this I, is well, what this is what I'm seeing all around. Everyone who's an expert in AI right now, who's got a venture fund or leading the charge, is waving the woke flag of, or the flag of, oh, we should regulate it, and we'll cut guardrails down. That's code words for leave us alone. Well, yeah, maybe, but I okay. think the, when I say Ab guardrails, I'm talking about, I'm talking about transparency. Um, so how did that, how did you get that answer? Like, where did that come from? What are the sources? Cite your, you know, you cite your sources, you know, uh, expose the black box. Yeah. Well, I think that, is, that's is, what I mean by guard. Is open AI <laughs> being transparent by open sourcing their LLM? Not ChatGPT, large language model, open AI. They just open source I would, it. I, I, would say, I would say the open source 
LLM. Open source is uh, the guardrail. Is, That's my point. Open source is yes, the guardrail. Yes, is, 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 is more likely to be transparent, of course, than ChatGPT. Um, is open source the guardrail? Yeah, I guess. Look, it's, look at what's I'm, done with security. I mean, open source is a, if open source done right, which has now generations of open source players in it, which you look at again, I was just at Open Source Summit in Vancouver with all the top people go there. There are, there, you know, my, our age, you know, I was in college, we stole software. You, there was no free software. Now you have free software. You don't have to code it. It's all out there and it's usable and permissive licenses. It's awesome. But one of the benefits of open source is transparency. You can see the code. You can download it, use it, build derivative works, Fork it. license. Yeah, so it's all there. And then you can make it, you can, it could be, there's risks of software supply chain, of course, but it's free. You can look at the code. So if you, if AI could be more open source, it by default has transparency. That's our argument about security. Is Amazon Web Services more secure than on-premise? Is open source more secure than proprietary code? You see the scale of the, of the transparency. So my point is, if open source has ball control of the industry, they will default by their behavior and their operating model, be more transparent. The question mm -hmm. is, <laughs> can they handle the growth that will come well, from that? Right, Right. that's the, that, cause it's wild west. I could make a case that, you know, I, I, I you know, people might trust IBM to be the steward more than just open source. You know, let me just make it up an example. Well, but, it could be fast and loose. I mean, but, but again, back to the guardrails. What does that mean? The, and again, I'm telling you right now, in Silicon Valley and all around the world where the people who are doing the work, funding, they're not gonna go against the, 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 the current trend of we need to be regulated. That is like just optics. In my opinion, that's complete optics, just saying that they're, they hear you, don't be worried, don't be afraid, AI's not gonna hurt you. Guardrails is code word for leave us alone. So I think this yeah, whole yeah. regulation but, thing is, is just posturing. I, I do think, I do think part, when I say guardrails, I think again, it comes down to transparency. Where, what's the data source? Like, how are you getting this answer? Where is it coming from? Because at one point I was chat ego GPTing and you'll love this. I actually started the cube with Jason Calcanis, according <laughs> to, to one, there was chat GPT. I was like, what? No, I had to tell it. Oh, sorry. It was John Furrier. And, and whereas, you know, a month ago, you and I started the cube. Well, I, I actually so. been testing not only ChatGPT and Bard, but go to Bing. Bing, yeah. Bing search is integrating search queries. So they have a different kind of thing. So I asked- Do you like Bing? Do you like Bing? Bing, Bing came up with a great response about the Silicon Angle and the Cube. It actually had metrics around traffic, leading site and enterprise. But then you go to search Silicon Angle and, uh, and like to generic word enterprise news, we're not even listed. But yet yeah, uh, Bing says, we're the leading enterprise publication with the Cube. Bart, it, actually, Bart said it, it actually figured out what most people don't know is that Silicon Angle and the Cube are one tenth thing. So Bing search with AI figured that out, but the search results generically don't. That's fascinating. And that's why I think Microsoft's smart to know that this could be a Google killer. I mean, they won't say it publicly. They're kind of saying, oh yeah, we're going to nip away at their market share. But that's why Google called the code red when Microsoft had that press event. That's why Amazon launched with the hugging face, their generative AI push, that's why uh, Kramer had to walk back his comments on Amazon not having AI just yesterday. So it's all like, this is what's happening. The big guys have AI, they have massive, they have the chops and they, they have the, the chops and they got the code, right? They got the people and the code. So, I mean, I, I gotta tell you, what's the incentive? If you see disruption, some of the, some of the, one of the big players has to topple. If it's truly revolutionary, Something has to get killed. Something dies in the industry. What? That's the question. Now, it might not be obvious that direct mail was a, a function. It could be a process. It could be a company. It could be a method. And I think that's what, what I, I'm looking at right now from a startup standpoint. Does that, is that a feature or is that a category? Is that a company? Now, if you're a feature, you can get in the market with that feature and then pivot to a category. So, and that's what happened with the web. You know, had the small little feature 
paid search, you work with Microsoft and Netscape, Google gets involved. You know, that was, was, was my, my angle. So that's going to be very interesting today to see how fast this happens. Now, unlike those other waves, time to market is so much faster. Even that startup we talked about today, their engineers are using Copilot and ChatGPT. Okay, so again. Productivity, the, the, it's off the charts. I mean, you can get into $7 million in seed funding and be with a MVP product market fit in months, maybe even weeks. Well, like I said, I mean, the, the results really vary and they vary over time. So I, I've said a number of times, I love Bard because it had the cube and Silicon Angle is the number one live TV program for enterprise tech, no longer. It now says CNBC is ahead of the cube. And I'm like, how can you say that? You know, well, it's got bigger reach. I'm like, <laughs> okay, but you know, a month ago, not even a week ago, the cube was number one. Now CNBC is number one. I like to be compared to CNBC. I mean, that's, well, I mean, that's a positive. We definitely go deeper than CNBC, although they're doing now eight minute segments. I just saw a great segment they did with the Hugging Face CEO, who we interviewed as well, but we did interviewed him weeks before. I mean, we get, see the thing about us and CNBC is we get the stories before they do, right? So, um, and because we have more deeper access in the industries, we have, we see the signals. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, same thing. We it depends, about, we it depends on the story. It depends on the story. I mean, they get earnings you know, stories yeah, well, before we do. Of I mean, course, we're not covering earnings, but if we did, right. we would get, we would have data that would <laughs> screw up the earnings uh, quiet <laughs> period. I mean, that much another area is going to get ranted. My rant is quiet periods will probably go away because everything's online. The, um, but even Wall Street Journal, that article that was out today, exclusive story. People aren't going to use chat CPT for confidential as a confidential. I, I, I wrote about that <laughs> and we, I broke that at KubeCon in Amsterdam. So, this new cycle on mainstream media is literally lagging the market by three to, to four weeks on the fast side. At least, yeah. If not months. We had super cloud conversations in 2021. Now the mainstream conversation is multi-cloud, okay? Um, again, this is the difference of this new world and you're going to see accelerated data. And this is why, you know, this is going to be a data tsunami that's going to be different than the big data wave in 2010, bigger than the data infrastructure build out we saw with Databricks and Snowflake. I think AI is going to address a core problem area in the enterprise that's going to be significant, which is the data infrastructure is getting so good right now in terms of managing. You got Snowflake event coming up, you're going to cover them. You got Databricks and other, you got at scale, you got all kinds of infrastructure handling data, horizontal and vertical. Now more data is coming in. The problem isn't the data, it's the data to manage the data. Is that good quality data? Data cleaning, data, these are like boring intern tasks. No one wants to do data cleansing, but it's now the most important with AI, clean data as a, in, as a, as a, as a training tool is the most important task and it's so hard. So, so it's going to be the done by machines. I think AI will do data cleaning. The world's, yes, the world's of business intelligence and you know dashboarding and reporting and AI are coming together, right? Because if you think about it, you know, my, think about what, what my son Roman does. He's a, he's a data analyst, right? He writes Python code and SQL queries to pull data and then builds Tableau dashboards and serves up the line of business, right? That's... He is, and people like him, these data analysts, they are essentially the semantic layer taking all these different data points, working with data engineers, data scientists, quality engineers, making sure those data elements are coherent and then presenting them. So that team, that data pipeline team, they are the semantic layer. AI combined with technologies from companies that do you know, semantic technologies, that's going to become the new semantic layer and essentially completely change the, what we've known as the data pipeline, my view. Yeah, and then your point about the, the prompt, prompts into BART, that's a query, if the data's not clean going in, you're going to have garbage mm -hmm. in, garbage out. And if, by the way, if the language model isn't ready for it, so it's, it's the data sets interacting with each other where the, I think AI will help do the, having clean data is like having a good prompt, right? So anyway, that's, that's in the weeds on the enterprise, but Dave, we got to get to the rant section because you're know, almost out of time. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, <laughs> I guess my rant is twofold. Elon Musk is in the news. Um, 
in, in his laptop comment about laptop glass. Uh, he also had an interview with the CNBC guy about the, with the Tesla earnings. That's my one rant, we'll get into that. And my other rant is this AI hype is off the rails in the sense of the conversation about regulation is ridiculous. The posturing of, we need guardrails. It's just optics. The industry needs to let this thing run. It needs to saute, it needs to get going. There's too much opportunities to do good things. And everyone's focusing on the bad things. And I think, you know, we have to keep an eye on it and hope nothing bad happens that's, that's obvious. Yeah, we'll watch it, but I think you don't want to regulate it. So I'm against the regulation and, and even offering that up as an option is just ridiculous. I thought Sam Altman was all wet on that. Other than that, he looked great in the in Congress hearings. And I think everyone should stop messaging this, you know, virtue signaling of, we need guardrails, you know, be careful. We're gonna take you know, pragmatic view. Just let it go. Fund the entrepreneurs, <laughs> get the open source cranked up and see what happens. And I think that's what's happening. Open source is getting cranked up, and everyone that I know that's entrepreneurial is jumping in. And, and we'll see how fast these guys can keep the talent, the big players. And I think the big players will have to adjust. Some will ride it, but this, the, the action is going to be a revolution. Um, well, talk about the, the laptop class, the Musk statements. I mean, I, I am by what he said. I mean, he, he said something to the effect of this laptop class is delusional. People have to come back into the office. I don't believe that. I mean, I think for, for, here's what I believe that people who are within, I don't know, let's say an hour of the office, they should come in. I would say they should come in two, three times a week. I think it's incumbent upon companies to do things to entice them to come in like, you know, taco Tuesday, or you get free health club membership. If you come to the office, you know, things like that, you know, but, but, you know, have a little carrot. But I also think that people that are in the office more, you know, interacting with the executives and their peers, I think they're going to have better upward mobility. Having said that, yeah. I've known years for years, salespeople are never in the office. They're out selling and they're extremely productive. They're some of the most valuable people in the organization. So I think I, I didn't buy that as a blanket statement. Everybody has to return to the office and the pejorative of calling people the laptop class. I mean, people he have, called, they're living in la la land. And he said, he said, uh, quote, the headline is laptop class needs to get off their moral high horse when it comes to remote work. Um, they're living in la-la land. Here's what I think. He's actually trolling. This is a tr he's been troll master for a while here. I like what he's doing with, that my, with Twitter, and I like how the product's getting better. Now you can put podcasts up there. Um, Jason Kalkanis is documenting this because he's in with Musk. Um, he, in, in his text message, he, sa he said to Musk when they reveal his text message, I give you my sword. That was Jason Kalkanis' private text to Elon Musk when he was... Um, when they when they release those texts, so we know Jason's in that crew, you, and you got also um, the All In podcast guys, David Sachs, a little bit right wing, Elon, a little bit, well, seems to be right wing. <laughs> He's a lot of it right wing. Well, and so <laughs> little trolling going on, little Donald Trump moves, which I don't, I'm not a, I'm not for. I think it should be more more leadership oriented, but let's face it, developers are virtual, so this the remote work to me is all about productivity. If people can work remotely like developers have been remote working remotely for years. Um, salespeople that work remotely, they want to close business. It's all about what the job is. I do think office work, and this is where I believe Andy Jassy had it right when he was on the Cube in 2020, 2021, talking about the impact of the pandemic. There are just certain jobs that have better outcomes when people are in the office. Collaboration jobs, brainstorming, you know, riffing on whiteboards. You know, even here, I was just chatting with Gabe, we're talking about the site and, and, and you know, our site. And when people riff, it's a sign of, you know, iteration and, you know, innovation is messy. It requires people to bang up against each other, debate, argue in a line. And sometimes that's very positive face to face and it becomes, you know, kind of, you know, lame when you're on Zooms and team meetings. So I think there is an element to that. I totally agree on that piece, but to say it's a generational thing is a troll. Now, there are, if people claim that like, I need to work at home, that's the way my work is, I think that's, that, that's a high horse. But I don't think that's happening. I mean, I don't see people like demanding that they work at home. If they have flexibility to work at home, I think that's more of a convenience issue. Commute, you're a single parent, you're a parent, whatever it is, that should be there. I think that's cool. That's not a moral high horse. I think that's a requirement. So my rant yeah. on that is, is that he's trolling, but yeah, people should be in the office when there's work to be built together, building stuff, 
in-person works. I thought the, um, I think the other thing is not really a rant, but I guess it is kind of picking up on that. I thought Musk's statements about the blue check mark were his strongest, you know, moments of that interview with the CNBC guy, because basically he said, you know, a lot of people talk about high horse, like I'm not signing up for the blue check. I, I earned my blue check and I'm, I, I, whatever. His point was, and I don't know if it's true or not, it could be, you know, revisionist history, but his point was the reason we implemented that is to protect against AI because AI can spoof anybody. And so if you have to get a credit card, sign up and pay eight bucks a month, you, you can't you know, buy a million bots. I mean, you could, but really the ROI is not there. It basically- He's right. Decreased, de I think he's right. He decreased the ROI uh, for the, the bot spammers. And I think that's a good call. And if it cleans up Twitter a little bit, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, now, is it a good revenue move? You know, that's part of it. I, I don't know. Well, I think uh, the, the, he confused the hell out of it because, well, first of all, the, the, the original blue check mark thing was a rigged game. That's why I brought up Jason Kilcanis. He was very vocal about that. He wasn't on that, on that list. I wasn't either. He and I should have been on that list in 2008, uh, 2007, when they, Kara Swisher was on the list. Giga O Malik was on the list. And they got millions of followers as a result. Millions of followers. That's incredible. It's an organization, right? That's a media company right there. That, that's a great newsletter. Uh, it's an audience. And so that was an unfair advantage. And, and Twitter managed that and used that to hand out favors. That's absolutely fact. And there's no, no one can debate that. That is just fact. Where he screwed up the current blue check marks, he wanted to make it about people. And... It really is more about the bots. You're right about that. And it's not about the people because you can buy a blue check mark and be anonymous and change, call your name, you know, not Dave Vellante, make up a name. Last night I jumped into a Twitter spaces I thought was pretty cool. And I jump in, there's 16, 25 people. I just checked it out. It's like walking into a, you know, private discord or something. And everybody on the stage and in the audience had handles that weren't names. And the conversation was really <laughs> rowdy. I got bounced out of that room in 30 seconds, literally removed from the room because my name was on it. And someone probably looked at me, saw that I was probably older and older and had my name, went to my profile and I got instantly bounced out of the room. They wanted a private chat basically. So, okay, whatever. But they had no names. So they're, they're, it's like the chat rooms when you have an anonymous handle. That's where toxic shit happens. So to me, I'm for more of the real name, verification, like, and, and a phone number, like WhatsApp. Um, I think that's better. Yeah, I think it's a positive. I, I, I agree. Um, so yeah, I, I, Twitter, it's, in some ways, is, I think a lot of ways is better now, right? I mean, you know, his whole thing about free speech, I, I think... I think he's got some good points there. He added views under your tweets and see how many views you get. I thought that's clever. That's good optical signaling. Well, uh, the other thing I like is you can you can actually you can edit your tweets if you have the blue check mark. You can write longer tweets. It compresses them like LinkedIn does. So there's some nice features there. It's not just about the vanity of the blue check mark. I don't really you know care about that. Well, I, uh, I like to know people have verified. All right, Dave, we got to wrap this up. We got a huge cube showcase coming up. First of all, our in-studio programming is kicking ass. We're doing more staged, you know, targeted virtual events that are really compelling, not just trying to replicate an in-person event, very targeted on a topic. I just lined up a great uh, set of um, AI panels I'm going to do with uh, Madrona Ventures and some other VCs. We're going to essentially do very focused experts on the Cube, with Cube alumni coming in, panels. We have our physical events are back again. I mean, you're seeing massive numbers at KubeCon more events, we got Dell Tech World Red Hat Summit, uh, we got t um, all kinds of events coming up. We got showcases, CrowdStrike's events gonna, on the roster, open source events. Unbelievable, HPE Discover is coming up. What do we got? <laughs> What's on the schedule? Are you, yeah, so, are you so, traveling? Okay, are we gonna so be we, traveling the whole month of June? We're doing road, yes, road podcasts? Yes, yeah, so we got, we got Dell Tech World and uh, op, uh, Red Hat. Uh, summit and slash Ansible Fest next week. Next, the following week is Memorial Day. The, the following week of that is Cisco Live. You and I will be there. After that is uh, AWS Reinforce. Are you going to that? Yes. 
Yeah. In Anaheim. I, okay, you got made my flights and I got, got reinforced. I don't have a hotel. And then, and then, uh, then I'm going to fly up that week to Palo Alto. We're going to do some stuff in the studio and do some super cloud uh, recordings because we got that going on. And then the week after that is Snowflake Summit and Databricks. Uh, Snowflake Summit's in Las Vegas. Databricks is in uh, uh, San, Francisco. San Francisco. And we got Mongo. Uh, is that that week? No. Uh, I'll, be at the I'll be at the Databricks event. You're going to be at Snowflake. And then when's M Mongo's that same week too, isn't it? June 22nd? Mongo DB is right after HPE Discover. No, oh, that's the final week. The last week is HP, HPE Discover. So we, we end we end the spring at HPE. And and like I say, Mongo, I think is the, t Mongo's the 22nd of June, well, John. Well, we got, I'll tell you right now, we got the July 18th SuperCloud 3. That's an event that's going to be about security and AI. That's booming. It's picking up great steam. We got great headline guests, thanks to you securing all the top CEOs in the big security companies. In August, we got confirmed that we're going to be at VMware Explorer in Vegas, not Moscone. And the week after, Google Next. Yeah, Google Next. Google we're back. Next is kicking Live. ass, man. We're getting some yeah. great traction from Google. Google's yeah. doing great. They're they're investing. Uh, and then September, you know, we got we got some openings. UiPath there. October uh, AI's right. super we got CrowdStrike. Crowd we're doing CrowdStrike and SuperCloud AI. Uh, SuperCloud Four mm -hmm. is AI, and these episodic SuperClouds are freaking awesome, Dave. I got to tell you, that's like a, it's like a super podcast. You know, it's really episodic, and it's topical. And then obviously we got uh, re in in November we got Microsoft's event, and we also got reinf reInvent. Looks like reInvent's going to be back to the old cube, where we're going to have you know, one stage, best guests, not the hundred interviews. So people watching right. should know that the cube is tapping out of doing hundreds of events, hundred of interviews. I mean, for you know, uh, on for AWS, they're going to take that in house. They're going to take it with on air, and it's going to be a, a sponsored, owned media thing. That's not the cube. The cube is independent, and uh, and more higher higher end quality. Um, the, the the paid stuff is just like buying a lanyard, so you get it. The OG cube yeah. from the second reinvent that we did. Well, um, reinvent became so big, it just became, it became a cube sprawl, and so you know Amazon, we you know we looked at maybe doing more cubes. We want to stay focused. We want the Swami on. We want Adam Selesky, Andy Jassy, uh, uh, Matt Wood, um, Peter DeSantis, James Hamilton. <laughs> Mylan. Mylan, all the top people we want on there. And by the way, their industry business is growing and international is huge right now. So I was you know, talking to VMware and all the cloud players. International cloud growth is coming and it's going to be look different than North America. Asia Pacific is a completely different marketplace as well, more smaller businesses. I think cloud is going to pick up a lot, Dave, in, in, in the international realm. So you'll see us in London, hanging out there with our team in London. It's good stuff all around the cube. And of course, Silicon Angle continues to grow in traffic and relevance. I got to tell you, the audience growth is a million uniques a quarter now, rolling three months and growing. That's, that's like big numbers and we push it everywhere. It's just on the site. There's audience in LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and all over these other outlets. So, you know, it's hard to put a TAM on it, but it's like five to 10 million, Dave. So let's keep, keep cranking. And, and get more videos on, on Silicon Angle. We're going to be we're going to be doing a lot. And our pods are growing. Breaking analysis is growing. We're we're up to we we're consistently close to or over or slightly under ten thousand downloads a week, yeah. which we're really proud of. I mean that's. I mean you should you good. could you could literally charge fifty k an episode, for that <laughs> product. That that is like Gartner McKinsey level. It is good. Analysis. I think. I mean, we got some good data in there. No, I'm, with serious, ETR I'm serious, stuff. Dave. Have you have you thought about this? Because like I look at like Gartner and like IDC and these analyst firms, they take one of those breaking analysis. You do them every week, by the way. Which is, by the way, I don't know how you do it. Your freaking brain is awesome. You take a breaking analysis every week. If they had that product, they would syndicate it and charge 50k. Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't know what they charge for, I mean, but uh, look, I, 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 I enjoy doing it. I, I love the same as you, John, when we met, we said, let's put out, let's, let's create more value than we extract. And so I think, 
Well, you know, I, I suggest anyone watching, if you're in the business of the enterprise tech, you're interested in what's going on in Wall Street inside. I mean, you're breaking so many scoops in those posts. Like you give buyer information. You, we have our own internal, uh, you have ETR data extracted. We have our data that we get from the cube kind of blended together. I mean, every Wall Street analyst I know is reading that. So the, the audience is super elite. I mean, I got someone all emailed me the other day and said, hey, can I, can you verify this breaking? And I was, that's Dave Vellante. Of course I can. It's a Wall Street <laughs> sell side, Dave. Okay, you get the buy side and the sell side all reading those posts. Because you know why? You bring in market share and you bring in the stuff that's going to lead into the earnings calls. I swear I heard a question that was came from your breaking analysis in the, in the last uh, Palo Alto Network's earnings call. I'll tell you what, I think I think some of these news outlets are, are reading it because I've noticed like the last year or so, after we do a breaking analysis on a major trend, we saw this with the chips when we, you know, we, we did all that analysis on Intel and ARM right after that. I mean, that's really when it started right after that. We saw all this coverage on some of the major <laughs> news outlets, Bloomberg, CNBC. I was like, hmm. They must be reading my stuff. If I wanted so, to start a newsletter, you know. enterprise newsletter, I would literally follow everything that we're writing on the, and then what events we go to in the cube and pick out two or three stories and you'd be the number one newsletter. All right, I'm hurting myself, Pat. <laughs> Pat <that's laughs> in the back. Dave, stop. this episode 12, if people want to give us feedback, we were looking for feedback. You know, our expectation is, is that, you know, the first 20, we're going to get our groove and try to find the format. We want to bring in guests. We've got to figure out how to schedule that in with our travel. When we're traveling, we're going to do remote remote podcast, give us feedback. Tell us what you think. What do you want to hear more of, less of? Um, and and we, want to, we want to grow this grow this podcast. So again, we're going to get the mechanics down, but it's fun, Dave. I like shooting the breeze. It's almost like we're having a meeting, you know? Yeah, I love it, John. Bring in some guests. Okay, that's episode 12. Thanks for watching, we'll, and we'll see you next time.